Hi, Monty. Great to see you. Thank you for being here. What's up? Not much, brother. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Good, good. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate the support. Definitely. All right, we're getting ready to get started. Hey, Barb. How you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you too. Glad you're feeling better. Hi, everyone, and welcome to um, the third class of the second iteration of Teach the Truth Thursdays. Um, this is an initiative that AADM has been doing um, since last year, um, really around teaching the truth um, and critical race theory. Um, today, we have uh, Damaris Dunn, who is doing um, a class on Dr. Mary Frances Early, um, and I'm going to pass the baton over to Chaplain Cole to talk a little bit more about Damaris. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Chaplain Cole Knapper, and on behalf of MOCA, Jasmine Johnson, and Noah Johnson, co-founders of AADM, 
Beth Mendenhall and Amelia Haynes Wheeler. It is my honor and privilege to introduce our instructor for the evening. But before I introduce her, I want to take a moment to give honor and make space for the quiet trailblazer, Dr. Mary Frances Early. Dr. Mary Frances Early is a living legend. At 85 years old, Dr. Early is the very first African American person to graduate from the University of Georgia. For years, decades really, her achievements and her long painful journey as a student at UGA went largely unnoticed until the pioneering work of Dean Emeritus, Dr. Maurice Daniels and his Foot Soldier for Justice documentary, documentary series brought her recognition. In her autobiography, The Quiet Trailblazer, Dr. Early talks about the night of January 11, 1961, the night that the nasty riot took place in the middle of UGA's campus that led to Charlene Huntergalt and Hamilton Holmes being suspended for their own good, as well as for the good of other UGA students. That's a critical point in her life when she decided that she would apply for admission to the University of Georgia. In her book, she writes, as my mother and I watched the telecast of the riot in horror, I made a decision. I would assist these two brave students in their efforts to integrate our state university by transferring from the University of Michigan to the University of Georgia. For 175 years, our state university, the University of Georgia, the oldest land grant university in the country had been segregated. And the governor at the time, Ernest Vandiver had proclaimed in his election campaign in 1960, no, not one Negro would integrate a Georgia public school. This was our governor, she wrote, the man meant to represent and lead the people of Georgia. His misguided sentiment chilled me to the bone. Mary Frances, Mary Frances's mother tried to scare her away from trying to integrate UGA by telling her about the horrific Morris Ford Bridge lynchings that had taken place a mere 14 years earlier in Monroe, Georgia, just 15 miles down, 15 minutes down the road from Athens. Lynchings that were meant to send a message to black people about staying in their place. Mary Frances Early told her mom, the injustices that we face every day won't stop until we do something about them. This is something that I can do and I want to do. Well, y'all, I'm a product of of Clark County Schools, but because I wasn't taught the truth about the desegregation of the University of Georgia right here in my own hometown, in my advanced placement American history class at Clark Central High, I didn't know that there was a racial caste system that still exists in this country, and that every day I am in fact judged and treated differently simply based upon the color of my skin. Because I didn't learn about Dr. Early's horrible racist experiences particularly the riot that happened right here in Athens on the UGA campus in school, I was ill prepared to handle things like racism, prejudice, and discrimination that I experienced in my life because I wasn't taught correctly. So tonight, as we center our hearts and minds to hear the lesson, I ask you to think about the lives of our children and how they could be different if they learned the truth about the violence that was visited upon Dr. Mary Frances Early as she integrated the University of Georgia. You see, I believe that if we are to move forward as a city, as a state, as a country, that we must unite in ways that our forefathers never dreamt of. That requires waking up. And we have allowed some ignorant people to tell us things that we know to be good for us are somehow bad for us. But as educated folk, we must demand that we wake up. We must recognize that we have elected officials who know that many of us are asleep at the wheel and they want us to stay asleep. They want you to continue to stay asleep. And they have convinced us that being woke is a bad thing. I'm here to tell you tonight, Athens, Georgia, it's time to get woke. And once we get woke, we need to stay woke. We need to wake up to the hatred that is being spewed right here in Georgia. Wake up to the violence that is being waged in our country, in our state, in our schools, and in our neighborhoods, and wake up to the suffering of others. Finally, we need to wake up to the life and death urgency of systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, climate change, the denial of healthcare, militarism, and the war economy. We need to get woke and stay woke in 2022. And so tonight we are lucky to have, and I am incredibly honored to introduce 
tonight's instructor, Damaris C. Dunn. She's woke and she's gonna wake you up too. <laughs> Damaris was born and raised in Queens, New York. She obtained her bachelor's degree in history from the State University of New York at Oswego in 2012. Upon graduation, she got an Ivy League education when she attended Teachers College, Columbia University, my alma mater, where she received a master's degree in history and education in 2016. Damaris began her career as a social studies teacher at Boys and Girls High School in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, Holla. On Saturday, she instructed spoken word and archival research at the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Cultures Junior Scholars Program in Harlem. In 2015, Damaris left the classroom to work for Global Kids, Inc., a nonprofit organization dedicated to developing youth leaders for the global stage. And it was while at Global Kids that Damaris served as a youth developer and the community school director, committed to creating space and place for Bronx youth and their families. Damaris is a PhD candidate in the Department of, exactly, yes, in the Department of Educational Theory and Practice at the Mary Frances Early School of Education at the University of Georgia, where the subject of her dissertation is the magnificent life of Dr. Mary Frances Early. She is committed to centering the lived and embodied experiences of Black women teachers and Black girls' joy in K through 12 settings. Ladies and gentlemen, siblings, without any further ado, I present to you our instructor for tonight's Teach the Truth Thursday, Ms. Damaris C. Dunn. Okay, everybody, we go home now. Chaplain Colden taught us all the things. Um, I'm super excited to be here. Montu, I see you. I owe you a visit. Uh, I am a PhD candidate, so that tells you a little bit about my life and where I have been for the past six months um, in my house doing work. And so um, I'm actually interested in, in Black women's labor, Black women teachers labor. And so um, Dr. Mary Frances Early was a teacher, um, a renowned educator, and that often kind of gets cut out of our experiences of her and who she is, um, besides her like integrating the University of Georgia. So we're going to talk together. We are going to be in community. Um, and we'll, I'm going to go from there. So what's the next? So we're going to do a little check-in. Um, we're going to listen to a song. Tell us what the song, what's coming up for us as we hear the song. Um, we're gonna talk about who our people are and, and how we get to do this work. Uh, in Mary Frances Early's book, she has a lot of people um, who held her down and pushed her forward um, in her time here at UGA. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about CRT and then we're gonna to switch to thinking about Black Crit, which is a lens through which to examine the archive. And then we're gonna play a little bit in the archive. Um, and so that is what I have for you tonight. So checking in, how are folks feeling today? How are we feeling? You could pop it in the chat. Talk back to me, please. Okay. How are we feeling today? I, so I got good, fantastic. Fired up. Okay. All right. Oh, but and then the chat says good, great, fired, feeling excited, dope. Awesome. 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 Okay. So we're just going to take a listen to this song. And as you listen, I want you to tell me what comes up for you and really how it relates to Black women and the work that they do in the communities that they serve. Okay. Give me the day, my daily bread. Help me to walk alone ahead. Though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no love. Oh, my smile, my mind reassure me I don't need no love. Woke up this morning with my mind set on loving me. With my mind. This morning with my mind set on loving me 
come, the lover may leave, the winter may now. Hey, the map of your palms, the temple you be, you're all that you got. The bad days may come, the lover may leave, the winter may now. The map of your palms, the temple you be, you're all that you got. Jamila Woods. Jamila Woods is an artist um, from Chicago. Uh, she also has a background in teaching and um, she's also a poet. And so what comes up for you when you think about the work of Black women, um, if we're thinking about Dr. Mary Frances Early, who obviously came to UGA at a time where she was not, uh, where she wasn't wanted. Um, and so how does that song apply maybe to, to how we might be thinking about Dr. Early? Y'all gotta talk back to me. Yeah. I think that you have to walk in your own power daily. So we got and so we got walking in your own power. Can you say it again? Walking in your own power. We got walking in your own power, committed daily. What else? What else is coming up for folks when you hear that song? I was thinking about the transformation of the song, right? So I woke up this morning when I stayed on. Jesus. And then back in the day, it ended up in the streets and it was woke up with my freedom. And then for her to, you know, take it and like bring it to this generation where we're doing a lot of inner work, like my mind stayed on loving me. To me, it's something that she is grounding her work in the work of the ancestors. Calling for I got it. I got it. So we got we got transformation of the song over time. So we got Jesus, we got freedom, we got inner work, we got grounding her work in the work of the ancestors. Um, and Dr. Dillard, who was previously at the University of Georgia, would call that remembering, right? It's, it's going back to fetch what we already know, right? And so she is deeply, uh, Jamila Woods is deeply grounded her work is deeply grounded in the ancestors um she has a whole album dedicated to black writers black artists black poets um and so that is her work and i think when i think about holy 
I'm envisioning Dr. Early walking through UGA's campus, um, trying to get to class and things being placed in her way. And she kept going and she kept going and she kept going. And she's the reason why I actually get to be on UGA's campus, right? Um, and so I think that we have to, it's very important for us to remember. And I put the emphasis on re, right? Because that means that we're going back to fetch something that we already know, right? Um, these are the things that push us forward. Barb says, Wood saying she was holy on her own, Dr. Early must have felt the same. She was on her own and she knew her own power and strength. And she sure did, her book says it. Um, her mom, her family really poured into her and allow her to push forward. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, and even though there were many, many, many things in her way, um, she continued to push forward. So thank y'all. So this is something that I've begun to do uh, in my practice around uh, folks introducing themselves. Uh, I am always, always going to ground my work in Black feminism because I am a Black woman. Um, and that really pushes how I walk through the world. And so I'm gonna start with Ella Baker. Ella Baker was a civil rights activist. She was the mother of the civil rights movement. Um, and she believed in, in radical change, meaning that we had to get to the root of the issue and we had to pull them things out of the ground and really work against the things that were holding us down. Um, and then Charlene Carruthers is an abolitionist who also believes in the work of Ella Baker. And so in her book uh, called Unapologetically Black, she asks a couple of questions and they, folks say that Ella Baker, when you enter the room, she would always ask you, who are you and who are your people, right? And so I just wanna start off by figuring out who's in the room. I know some folks better than I know others. And so if you could just share, you could pop it in the chat or you could speak to me. And so who are you? Who are your people? What do we want? What are we building? And are we ready to win? And so. Just take a moment to either put it in the chat or we can speak to one another um, about that. A black father, yes, yes, yes. Who else are we? Sure. Uh, I'm a white woman from Georgia. Amelia is a white woman from Cummings, Georgia. She is a comrade in the struggle. She is a organizer. She is all things labor. <laughs> um, uh, and she is kind. All right, so that's what I'm putting. And she's a partner, so I'm gonna throw that in there too. She's a Buddhist. Okay. And Barb said, I'm a volunteer. I'm a secretary with AADM who sent me a Subway gift card for Christmas and I appreciate you because I used it um and then she said my people are AD AADM family who advocates for racial and social justice absolutely um Beth Mendel said I am a teacher I know we got some other folks in here I'm putting you on the spot I was just going to share the way um girl track is a movement that I love and they always I'll say I'm Sarah 
the daughter of Kathy, the daughter of Ruby, the mm -hmm. daughter of Louise, the daughter of <laughs> so okay so we have laura in the building who is also the founder of joy village the joy village school right in athens so we need to snap for that clap for all of that and she mentioned who she is the daughter of and she talked about girl track which is an organization that if you are on any social media platforms you should follow um and then Chaplain Cole Knapper is in the building. Yeah. And so she said she's a student of life. She is people, my people are educators to educate the mat. The goal is to educate the masses, which she is doing with Teach Two Thursdays, um, a civil rights movement uh, with justice and equity at the forefront. Um, and we are on our way. We're not there yet, but we're on our way. Um, and then Matu said, Black hip hop folks are my people. We want tangible power. We are rebuilding the community um, and we will do whatever is necessary to win. That's a fact, that's a fact, that's a fact. Okay, so I'll keep it moving. Um, thank you for telling me who you are and what you're here for. So part of the reason why uh, Teach Truth came about is because of this fight against critical race theory. And so we know that right now there are tons of bills that have been placed, um, particular like in places in places like Georgia, um, in Florida. Uh, there's a "Don't Say Gay" bill. So a lot of a lot of the young people who we serve are really under attack. We're under attack, um, and so in the early uh, '80s, uh, Bell. Uh, why am I, why is his name escaping me? Derek Bell um, and, and his students at Harvard push for uh, critical race theory to be a thing, right? So they were in class together, beginning to theorize around this notion of critical race theory. And all critical race theory is, um, is a legal and an academic framework that argues that systemic racism exists in American society. And when we think about that, um, I don't think there's anybody in this room, in this room, in other rooms maybe, that could argue that that's not true. Um, my ancestors experienced racism. Uh, I experienced racism in Athens, Georgia, as I moved throughout this space often. Um, I had to come to the South to, to really understand what it means to put critical race theory to work as a framework, as a, as a scholar. And so um, a lot of this uh, has spurred as a result, the frustrations around critical race theory has really spurred due to white rage and white emotionality. And Montu talked about this notion of power, right? Like it's, it's taking back power. And so in 2020, during the uprisings when folks were flipping things and burning stuff up, it was a message to say that we're here and we're not going anywhere, right? And, and the response to that was white rage and white emotionality. And so critical race theory has been under attack ever since, right? Um, and so it says like this little timeline starts in 1980 to really mark where critical race theory kind of came about. And then it goes to 2020 to talk about the uprisings. But this has been happening happening way before 1980. <laughs> and, it, and it's going to happen, unfortunately, well after 2020. Um, and I hope that my, I don't know, my children's children get to see a day where that is not the case. Um, but this is a long fight because it's so ingrained in everything that we do, right? And so I just want to make it clear that this is a legal and an academic framework, right? And so, but it's it's become something else and has been placed in the media as, as something else. And so here are the tenets of CRT. And so it says that racism is ordinary. Um, it says that there's this notion of interest convergence, which means that racism advances the interests of both white elites materially, meaning like homes, cars, access, that's the material piece, right? College, um, 
things that you have access to wealth right money and then and then working class whites physically right so that all kind of ties in and then another component of crt says that um black folks latinx folks native american folks asian folks are the only ones that can tell their stories and they can tell their stories in a particular way because of their own material conditions and how they live in the world right so as a black woman i have a particular story that i can tell that no other black woman can tell right and the same is true for other folks of color so other by poc folks um and then crt also says that white folks um benefit from civil rights legislation so things that were supposed to be put in place for uh for for black folks to benefit be it affirmative action it actually worked out that those things really benefited white women and not necessarily the folks that it was supposed to benefit right so when we start to think about the tenets and what they actually mean this is what they mean and this is why folks are so up in arms and at the same time i don't think folks really understand what what the theory is actually saying right so it's just like critical race theory oh my goodness it's the end of the world but not really having any validity about what it, what they actually mean and what things are arguing for and again if we look at these we know that we can't really argue that these things are not true because they are um they are so carol anderson she's a scholar at emory university and she talks about white rage and she says this and it's like on page three of her book she says white rage is not about visible violence but rather it works its way through the courts the legislatures and a range of government bureaucracies it wreaks have it wreaks havoc subtly almost imperceptibly right so like this notion of white rage is really not about i mean it's, it's a both end it's the kkk and it's like legislation that allows folks to get away with, um, you know, folks not having access to things, particularly black and brown folks, right? So when we think about white rage, um, when we think about the responses that folks right now currently are that they have to black advancement, right? This is what what, what white, white rage is really talking about, right? So when we see um, don't say gay, or when we see that you cannot teach um, slavery, it, it, you know, in the curriculum, in the social studies curriculum, like this is white rage, right? It's, this is the way that folks have kind of put this into play. And so there are multiple uh, theories and that come out of CRT. So black crit is one of them. There's Latinx crit, there's indigenous crit, there's Asian crit, there's all these different crits. And so one of the ways that we're kind of gonna, one of the crits that we're gonna use tonight is anti, um, not anti, we're gonna use black crit theory to think about uh, Mary Frances Early's archives. And so black crit theory says that anti-blackness is endemic. Um, it says that blackness exists in tension with neoliberal multicultural imagination. Um, it calls for black liberatory fantasy. So for us to dream of worlds beyond the ones that we exist in. Um, and then it resists a white revisionist history of the erasure of white violence, right? So it resists the notion that we can't begin to have conversations about um, the history of enslavement in this country. It resists the notion that you know, that black folks um, have other histories beyond pain, right, and suffering, right, and that like, there are other preoccupations of black life, like joy, and happiness, and love, um, that we ought to be teaching in our school's curriculums. And so we're going to use this a little bit today. And Kiana Ross says this, Anti-Blackness is one way some Black scholars have articulated what it means to be marked as Black in an anti-Black world. It's more than just racism against Black people. She says that that oversimplifies and defangs it. It's a theoretical framework that illuminates society's inability to recognize our humanity, the disdain, disregard, and disgust for our existence. And so 
What are some examples of anti-blackness? Do we have any? I think there are plenty, unfortunately. Okay, so recovery, substance, thank you for sharing. Recovery and substance spaces, there are a few. Black folks, which speaks to an issue of access, for sure, right? What are some other things? What are some other examples of anti-Blackness? So the crown act, so how people, particularly black girls get to wear their hair in schools. Um, and then even black women, like if you decide to lock your hair, right? Like that is for, for a long time in certain spaces was prohibited, right? Um, leaving folks out of the curriculum, also anti-blackness. What are some other examples? The, the trope of the welfare queen, right? This idea that like, Mm -hmm. The trope of the welfare queen. Uh, Montu says the media, school curriculums, militarization of police. Absolutely. Um, and when we think about who's on welfare, <laughs> it's not as I mean, when we look at numbers, mm -hmm. Black folks are not leading in those numbers, right? Um, and I'm, I, I, I will not call out the group that is, but I will say that Black folks are not leading um, in those numbers. And so that is also a form of anti-Blackness. Um, other things? Give me one more. So the maternal death rate. Mm. So like internalized racism. So there, so there are some black folks who are also anti-black. Mm -hmm. For sure. Huh? The paperback. The, so um, that that so the the brown paper bag test has to do with colorism. Mm -hmm. So folks would take a bag mm -hmm. and put it up to your skin, and if you were lighter than the bag, then you were somehow better, and if you're darker than the bag, then you're somehow not yep for sure for sure so yes yeah, so anti-blackness is like a stream of consciousness um it's the way that we kind of look at black folks and it, and it really has a lot to do with them with our material conditions right the, the 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 effects of how we live and be in the world so we could say that that mary Frances early experienced racism but we could also say that we could apply anti-blackness to her experience, right? And that really speaks to the specificity of what it means to walk on UGA's campus as a black woman, right? During the time that she walked on UGA's campus, right? So it is racism, it is white supremacy, but it is very much so anti-blackness, right? And so I'm gonna show you a little video because I want, Dr. Early to speak for herself. I don't wanna speak for her. Um, and then we're gonna go and dig into the archive and I'm gonna do a, a small, a brief reading from her book. Mary Francis Early, you have been helping to build a beloved community, to build a truly multiracial democracy in America, to make our country to make our world. We couldn't go to the symphony or any of the other programs that were going on here in Atlanta because Atlanta has always been a cultural mecca. Uh, I remember once being on a bus with my mother. My mother was very fair and she looked very Caucasian. And the bus driver got up and came back and said, you'll have to move, you can't sit with this white lady. And I said, that's my mother.
the first students to integrate the University of Georgia. She read of their bravery in the face of overt racism and hostility, and she decided to return to Georgia to contribute her own story to the cause of social justice. When I saw the televised version of the, the riot that was going on here, and a, a, a picture of Charlene holding a Madonna, and Hamilton looking very sad in a car being driven back to Atlanta, I said, they can't do that. I saw those two young people and felt that I needed to join the struggle and do what I could to help in the segregation that was so prevalent in the South. I was going to the library one evening, and uh, it was in the evening, and it was dark, and it was a beautiful night. And uh, these guys were spread across the steps at the library, and as I approached, one of them said, I smell a dog. And there were some guy, guys across the street, and they threw, started throwing little pebbles. They weren't big rocks, they are little pebbles. And a couple of them hit me. So I picked up one that was rather much larger, and I threw it back. I didn't throw to hit them, but I said, I'm not that nonviolent. <laughs> Chaplain Cole's having church in here, y'all. <laughs> y'all can't see her, but she's having church in here. Okay, so I wanted to read you like just a, a, a small excerpt from her book. And it's on, if you have the book, it's on page 59. And she says, accepted but not welcome at UGA. She says, before I actually entered, news articles appeared in the Atlanta Journal and the Constitution about my possible admission. I was working for the Atlanta Inquirer, a militant black newspaper as its music editor. The Inquirer published several articles about my application to UGA. One article stated that my mission would represent a victory for black teachers in Georgia because they would be eligible to enroll at UGA rather than travel to Northern or Midwestern states for advanced study. Now, Dr. Early was at uh, University of Michigan in Detroit before she came to UGA. Um, and so she says, remembering that one of the requirements was a personal interview with the registrar, I hadn't been invited to campus for the interview. I boldly wrote letters to Registrar Walter Danner and to graduate into the graduate school, Dean Gerald Huff, informing them that I would visit the campus during our school systems spring break for interviews. I then scheduled the interviews with Mr. Danner and Dean Huff. Jess Hill drove me to Athens for the interviews. Interview with Dean Huff was very pleasant. He was friendly and encouraging um, about my potential admittance. The interview with Mr. Danner and his assistant, Paul Kia, however, was quite unpleasant. I was asked if I had ever visited a house of prostitution. I responded in the, in, in the negative, telling them that I was a teacher, a professional, and had no reason or desire to visit a house of prostitution. This question still rings in my head as an utterly disingenuous and insulting attempt to undermine my self-esteem and dignity. Mr. Danner then told me that UGA might not accept my credits from the University of Michigan and that I would lose all of that time and money. My immediate thought was UGA might not accept credits from one of the top 10 universities in the nation. That thought, however, remained unspoken. And so uh, Dr. Early was one of many black teachers who went to universities outside of the South um, to get an education. And then folks would come back to the South and teach children in the South, right? So um, there's a, a ton of uh, books out there uh, that talk about folks who went to Columbia and came back down South. Uh, before desegregation, there were close to 60,000 teachers who were Black in the South. And post-segregation, so when we talk about post-Brown, that diminished... Um, that number diminished heavily with regards to Black teachers. And so today, when we think about Black teachers and where they are, um, and we only have about 5% of Black women teachers, 
or two percent of black male teachers um in the country at this moment so when we think about what brown versus board of education really did um for a lot of folks they're like rah rah brown but when we think about what 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 we lose when we lose 60 70 000 teachers in the south um we lose a lot and so folks like uh dr early were, were there were a lot of them who lost their jobs as principals um and so we have to think about like what happens to education when we lose all of these black educators right doing the work on behalf of black people and dr early talks a great deal about her teachers in school and like what they did for her and she refers to some of the black women teachers that she had that really pushed her along. And so um, we really have to think about that in the context of education today, because I think sometimes we take for granted uh, the fact that there are like just few, a few black teachers. So there are a few Montus, there are <laughs> a few, a very, like there's a handful, right? We could put you in a convention center and bring everybody together and that would be it. Right, um, so we really can't take that that for granted at all, and we have to think about what that means for like historically and contemporarily, um, with regards to teaching and learning. And so, I'm gonna move us to some of my babies uh, who are actually in college now or at the top. So, right here, she's in college. And then at the bottom, we have one student who's on their way to college, but I really was introduced to the archive when I was an undergrad. Um, and I had never been to the Schomburg. Uh, so I've lived in, I lived in New York City for 31 years of my life. And it wasn't until I was about 21 that I was exposed to the Schomburg. And actually my white woman professor, Dr. Geraldine Forbes, who I love dearly, um, and I mean, she edited the mess out of my work. And so she was like, you've never been to the Schomburg? And so when I was there, I studied uh, mixed race women slave traders. And so that was the only place that I could really go and get information. And fast forward to, I wanna say maybe five years after I graduated uh, college, I was given an opportunity to, uh, do some community service work at the Schoenberg because I, I needed some hours for, to, for being at Columbia. And then I ended up landing a job there and, and ended up being there for five more years. And so the Schoenberg is really, um, I've had a lot of full circle moments in my life that have, have brought me back to certain spaces. And so Schoenberg is home. Um, it's in Harlem, it's on 135th Street. If you've never been, you need to go. Um, it's like all things black. It's like the hugest black library. Um, in the country. And so um, when I had the opportunity to come to the archives here at UGA, um, I've been hearing about this woman, Mary Frances Early, right? And I had no idea of the magnitude or what it was that she did, but I got to sit in archive and learn about her and I just got lost in her documents, right? And so there's a woman, her name is Linda Lindman, and she talks about playing in the archive and the significance of playing in the archive for young people um, and what it means to them. But I think it also applies to adults. And some people look at the archives as a contentious space, but then some people also look at the archives as sites of reclamation. And so my students at the Schoenberg really looked at it as a, as a site of reclamation and a site where they could do this work of Black liberatory fantasy that Black crit um, is pushing us to do. And so I mix these two, because when we're talking about this notion of remembering, right? I want to remember the young people who really pushed me to really do the work in the archive and then also remember Dr. Early um, as a person that brought me to the archive here. And so I just want to take a moment for us to think together. Um, I thought I would have some young people in the group. So I didn't know if they would really know what an archive was, but I think y'all have a sense of what an archive is. Um, but why do you think that the archive is, could be a site of contention for some, or tension, a site of tension for some? Might find out something 
You might find out, you might, Laura say, you might find out something you didn't want to know in the archive. That's very true. Other things, why might it be a site of tension? Who gets, I mean, whose stuff gets placed in the archive? That's what I was just thinking about, just like the absence of black faces and black records, right? Mm -hmm. um, just like, it's probably a race white mm -hmm. So Amelia said that there's typically probably an absence of black folks in the archive and, and by and large, it's probably white men's papers. Um, go to UGA's archive, you'll find that. Um, I think you probably have to dig a, a, a bit deeper to hear certain voices um, in the archive, pending what type of archive it is. Um, what are other tensions that might come up? Mm. Mm -hmm. So literacy is something that will come up in the archive if you if you don't if you can't read the word, right? Because I think people can read the world. Right, so literacy to me is how we read the world. But if you can't read the word, then it makes it difficult for you to interact with archival work. And I think that's a great point um, for sure. Um, any other tensions? For me, one of the tensions was being at the Schomburg and young people were not necessarily allowed in the archive, even in a space that was for them. Um, and so one of the things that I grapple with, with, with some of my colleagues who were very supportive, but initially were just kind of like, they're too loud, they're doing too much, right? And so it's like, these are just much their papers as it is anybody else's, and so they need access, right? So I think ageism kind of comes up in the archive writ large. So just not at the Schomburg, but just like across the country, right? That certain, you have to be a certain age to work with certain documents. And I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily um, right. Um, so that's a tension that came up for me being an archive with young people. Um, can the archive be a site of reclamation? What do y'all think? Can it be a site of reclamation? I see Montu moving his head. Mm -hmm. Chaplain Cole says, yes, yeah, absolutely. tell us why. Um, I just see it as um, maybe, as others have said, if there isn't a lot of uh, representation for um, marginalized voices, those um, You can find joy in the archive. Uh, my home girl, my home girl Amber Neal. She just she just finished her uh, her doctorate at UGA, and she talks about archival goodness, um, and she kind of pushes for that because she's like there are ways to reclaim ourselves, um, and she feels like the archive is one of them. And she talks about Black abolitionist um, teachers, and so her work is really dope. Um, other things about the archive where, where it could be a site of reclam uh, reclamation? I was thinking about, you know, you talk about white rage, right? Um, and segregation and how that's really erased from the narrative that we're told to teach. And so the Twitter quote, I think that's the Twitter. Mm -hmm. It is. I don't use Twitter. It is. But right, like that it's heartbreaking but like when, if you go look at newspapers, like you're reclaiming the truth of like the foundations of our nation's history, right? And so it's not reclamation in the way that y'all have been using it, but I think like a reclamation of like a accurate portrayal of like how mainstream and dominant this was, right? Mm -hmm. um, like Mariah Parker came and did a, a professional development with some social studies teachers, Monty was there, and she called it like pulling the receipts. Yeah. Like it's like, no matter what you, you say this is a divisive concept or not mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Mantu, Mantu says it, it can be hard because white men have always controlled the narrative. So it's hard to read more white narratives. But I guess if you dig deep, you can hear black voices. And I think it's true. I think you got to know what you're looking for. Um, I think if you spend enough time in the archive, you can stumble upon things. Um, when when Lemon talks about playing in the archive, she talks about this stumbling, right? Like we stumble on um, things. But I think I think to be in the archive also means that you have to have time. I don't, I, you know, when I think about being able to come to UGA, uh, essentially like quitting my job and having full funding, right? That's time. But the black people that I know, they work nine to fives and maybe even nine to twelves, right? And so I think that this notion of being able to play in the archive really requires you to have time, right? And time is, 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 has material, like it, it has material effects on how we move throughout the world. Um, so I think that we can reclaim things when we have time, when we have rest, <laughs> when we have access uh, to the things that we need. And so I think it's very important for us to, to know that like there, we're there. We exist in the archive, but we got to do a lot of digging, right? Yes, there's so much privilege tied to that, right? There's so much privilege tied to that. You're sparking in me, you know, lately I've been doing these Black History Dance Breaks on, on Instagram, which mm -hmm. is a way, when you're framing this as, um, you know, playing in the archives as something that requires a certain amount of privilege, being able to then take what you've gleaned and disseminate it broadly, like it's almost like a redistribution of wealth in a sense, like mm. the value of the time that mm. to get this information. Um, so there's a lot of power in doing that. And I was also resonating with what Monty said about having to read the white narratives, because when I first <laughs> when I first um, uh, set out to learn Athens Black history, I was I was looking in kind of a narrow lane. But now I'm starting to move towards like I just I just found a PDF online uh, called it's a book called the the Sun She Gave, which is a like from a white lens the Civil War years of Athens. But it's talking about you know the like the percentage of enslaved persons to like citizens here at the time and how two of the biggest secessionists were from our city. And it's like, I, I need that. I need that information too, to really hear, to, you know, to frame these other voices that I'm learning from. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was just resonating with mm -hmm. a lot of what y'all were saying. Yeah. It's this, I love that how, how uh, Laura said the redistribution of wealth and I put the re the emphasis on the re Right. Because, again, it's like going back. We notice information. We notice history. We, we it's a part of us. Right. We it's in our blood. Right. And so like rediscovering it um, and being able to give it to our babies. Right. To to is so important. Um, like it's so, so important. And Amantu said, please tell her to email me that I need that in my life. Right. Yes. So like, yeah, I think this, like this, this notion of reclamation, this notion of redistribution, right. Things that we've lost along the way, but very much belong to us. Right. And so um, Erica Buddington and Amelia got at it a little bit. She talks about, she's a historian and she talks about, she just, always puts out like this really cool information online about history that I really just never knew about. Um, so I learned about Lake Lanier from Erica Buddington. Um, I also learned that I will not go to Lake Lanier because <laughs> people drown in Lake Lanier. Um, and my ancestors don't want me there, so I'm not gonna go, right? But um, I learned about Lake Lanier from Erica Buddington and how like, this whole black town um, is underwater. And so when we think about things like Atlantis, and when we think about like these places that people have rewritten um, or have thought about or have like kind of Disney-fied, right? These are real places. These are real people. These are real stories. Uh, and the first thing that I thought about when I learned about Lake Lanier was Atlantis, 
like this underwater place um, where people were thriving, uh, which I think is, which is interesting, right? And so she talks about, I really want to sit folks down in front of a digital archive and tell them to search antiquated, atrocious terms like Negro or colored with their hometown names, set the dates, 1865 to 1960, um, and you'll be immersed in sorrow. Nowhere time in America has ever been good to us. Um, and I, while I agree with that, I wanna challenge that a little bit because a lot of my work uh, centers black joy. A lot of my work is interested in radical black joy. And so I think that where there is pain and sorrow and grief, black folks are always finding joy. The students in your hallways who are dancing, who are banging on lockers, right? Like they're, they're finding these fugitive spaces to be. Um, they might even find those spaces in the classrooms where they feel welcomed, where they feel seen, where they feel heard, right? And so I wanna trouble this notion that like all black people are is pain and suffering and sorrow because we are so much more than that. Our music says it, um, how we show up in the world says it, how we dress, how we carry ourselves, right? Like that says a lot about who we are more than like the pain and the struggle and the sorrow. And that's there too, right? But we, we ought to hold both. And so what I want us to do is I want us to look for the tension in the archive, in, in Dr. Early's archive. And some of you were here with me in the fall. So these papers might look different, but I'm asking different questions, right? So I want you to look for the tension and I want you to look for the sites of reclamation um, where we can reclaim Dr. Early's experience at UGA and then also the tensions that she had. So I'm gonna go to the next page and then I'm gonna pause my screen so that I can drop this stuff in the link because I don't wanna stop my share. I got a QR code, yes. So you could do it on your phone. Um, pause share. Make sure I'm doing this right. I'm gonna copy this link. Okay. And then I'm gonna resume the share. And this is what you should see on your screen. Okay. And the link is there. And so the questions are what do you notice? How are you reading anti-Blackness in Dr. Early's papers? What are the tensions and what can we reclaim in her paper? So just take a moment, have a little fun with it. Play in the archive a bit. And if you know anything about Padlet, you can add a comment, you can like. What are the tensions? We reclaim. The questions are in the chat. What are the tensions? What can we reclaim? Mm -hmm. What are the tensions? What can we reclaim in Dr. Early's papers? That's the thing too. Maybe you can't reclaim her writing. <laughs>
All right, I'm gonna bring us back because I feel like folks have kind of looked at these documents a little bit and you have the link so you can always go back to it if you want, you wanna use it. Um, but what do you notice? Uh, how are we reading anti-Blackness in Dr. Early's papers? Um, what are the tensions uh, and what can we reclaim? she saw exactly through these like lies and these attempts to swindle her like you know she's writing like bald liars in the margins mm -hmm. and very neat handwriting mm -hmm. we can reclaim what dr early puts on the margins for sure because yeah. she's talking back yeah. right to um anti-blackness white supremacy um uga uh in a very particular way, right? So she enters these spaces knowing like what she is up against, but is finding ways to reclaim space for herself, right? Which is really important. And Amelia also said that like, it's very clear that anti-Blackness um, is apparent in the housing letter. Um, so yes. And then Chaplain Cole, you wanna talk about what you got? Dr. Mary Frances Early had in the face of serious anti-Black racism at, at every turn. And she, you know, I, I love the artifacts that you've chosen for um, this Padlet where, you know, you show her with exceptional transcript, right? Um, and then it's just, I think the, the uh, discussion with the, uh, her diary entry about having to sit, just the abject loneliness that she felt um, in Snelling Hall, right? In Snelling mm -hmm. Dining Hall. Um, and how many people have, have eaten in, in that dining hall? Um, so just to, to know that this happened right here in Athens at the University of Georgia. Anti-Black racism. Um, real liveliness, right? Like it's real, it's here. Um, and nothing says that better than her own diary entry. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What are some other things that folks are seeing? What can we reclaim? We definitely see the tension. Um, I think to, to, to Chaplain Cole's point about like her, um, her good grades, like her transcript. I don't know about y'all but it's really hard for me to do good work when there are a lot of other forces wow, right? surrounding me that are telling me that I cannot, mm -hmm. right? Or if I made up in my head that like, what is happening to me is, it, it's almost crippling. And so I think to like have a transcript, like such an impeccable transcript in the face of all of this stuff um, is really a testament to who she is but it also humanizes her, right? Like you doing all of this, but I'm still getting a grace, right? You doing all of this, but I'm still showing up to class and doing what I have to do. And y'all can't deny me those good grades because I'm doing my work, right? Um, and I think that that like, it is just a testament to who Dr. Early is. Um, folks always talk about her in line with, uh, her desegregating UGA's campus, but she was an incredible teacher, like an incredible, credible music teacher. And that's a whole other part of her identity that we don't get 
but her transcript tells us why, right? Um, she was very immersed in like the field of music, like that was her thing. Um, and so it's, it's so important to honor that um, as we honor her desegregation of this hyper white space. Um, you know, like we have to hold those two truths, but I, I just, I found it incredible to actually look at her transcript and just see A's and B's. Because yeah, I might have had a D for Damaris. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. What you gonna say, Montu? I said, and speaking on that, the first thing I can't thought is, okay, those are... You can't hear me? Oh. Well, I don't know what's... I can hear you now. You can hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so speaking on that, it's funny because those are B pluses. And I kind of wonder, because she seems like an A student, I kind of wonder if those B pluses, if, uh, I don't know. Like, I almost think like they possibly were probably A's, but you didn't want to give the A. So you gave her everything you could, but she's like, you're not good enough to get the A. So those B pluses even kind of look kind of strange to me amongst, you know, this, because I really believe they probably were A's. I mean, that's just, I don't know, I don't got no proof or nothing, but that's just kind of what I thought. I thought them are probably A's. I agree. I agree. Other things that we're seeing? Of course, the letter from King, right, is something we can reclaim. Um, it, it's just, is it's Dr. King sending you a personal letter saying, I see you, um, job well done, keep doing the work. Um, there were so many black women who are part of this movement that really go like understudied, be, and I mean, they, we were there, we were there, we were doing the work. Um, whether it was cooking the meals, um, you know, I think people really downplay the work of Coretta Scott King. Um, and so I just think that like black women knew that they had to prop up black men in these movements to be able to get things done. Right. Like that, that was very intentional. Um, but I think even when we frame the civil rights movement, we have to think about Rosa Parks and her work with Reese Taylor um and, and 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 how we might reframe our understanding of like what was really happening and why why this movement actually started to begin with and so there's a scholar I want to say her name is Danielle McGuire and she talks about uh the civil rights movement and she reorients our thinking and the genealogies of the movement from the rape of Reese Taylor she says that the civil the civil rights movement started there um and so it's a, it's a really interesting text to read and to think about, you know, like why the movement began to begin with. And a lot of people um, back her in saying that like it really started with like Black men and Black women were recognizing that Black women were disproportionately being raped. And that is the reason why, right? There was so much um uproar around why that work needed to be done and so I think yeah Danielle McGuire's book is, is fantastic um and y'all should really check it out because it really reorients and, and reshapes our understanding of how we think about the civil rights movement um because Rosa Parks Rosa Parks was fierce you know everybody talks about her as this old lady on the bus but she was she was a problem um and so i i think that yeah i think that there's so much there's so much there and there's so much to uncover and there's so many things that we can begin to teach young people beyond what exists in the literature that we see in schools so i think i'm close to time um anybody have any questions comments concerns um I want to leave room for that because I know last time I went over, but this time I'm like, <laughs> I'm right there. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. yeah. Yeah.
behind the mask of chivalry. If you don't know about it, you should. Um, I think it's interesting because when I went to Alabama, if y'all have been to the, the um, Equal Justice Initiative, they have the, um, the plaques, right? And it, it kind of, and they, it names the folks based on like documents and records of who was lynched. But when you go and you look for athens Clark County, there were very few folks that were like kind of actually like names and I found that to be really interesting um and I looked and it's and I what I also found to be interesting is like I looked from my like my my family's from North Carolina and so as a black person in that space I was looking for my family right like I was like is done there do I see done is done there um and so I think it's interesting that that Chaplain Cole put this um, this book in the in the chat because I think that as Black folks we we look for ourselves in different things whether it be in the archive whether it be on these lo these plaques that we know have everything to do with our demise but we're still like searching for something to connect with um, and so I think I think that's interesting I, I'm probably gonna look for myself in Ghana too this summer. Um, but like, I think it is, it's really important to, to really, to think about that, um, how we look for ourselves. Um, are there other comments? What's coming up for you as you leave this space? I just want to say that May is the National Truth Telling Day. And um, one of the things that they recommend is like teaching Marriage, you did such a beautiful job of reading and just you know, all y'all out there in Cyberland world, teacher, bar, Montu, um, you know, like let's all commit to like reading these truths in this national truth telling day and like realize that it is part of a movie. Yeah, I just I was really struck by the poignancy of you reading that book and like damn, like mm. this would be like do we do this more publicly more times? Yeah, I'm thinking about, so me and Amelia were just at a conference um, this past weekend, and there was a professor, Dr. Boosie, and he talked about like reading in public spaces with people. Um, and so that's, that's making me wonder about like, where do we convene to read aloud, um, you know, to disrupt? And then Laura is over here moving her hands off. So with the black woman speech so uh-huh so next week is the day of jubilee for athens so may 4th was the day that enslaved persons in this county got the news you know authored and published hmm. earlier um so it's really our juneteenth and i've been reaching out to local leaders like what are we doing dance in front of the courthouse yeah. i wouldn't dance in front of the courthouse mm -hmm. okay okay we're learning we're learning other things i was thinking about um finding your roots um henry lewis gates and, and it was just it just occurred to me oh wow that's the arc that's archival data like what we've been doing today and it, i'm always so fascinated by that, you know, learning about um, people's lives and their families and their generations and where they came from. And, and he does all that. He, he brings out all this um, real, you know, he's looking at, at what's happened 
in the past with documents, you know? And so anyway, it just kind of occurred to me, oh, wow, that's what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And take a picture of that too. Yeah, I'm going to be emceeing that. Okay. 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 So I'm getting the signal. Mm -hmm. I appreciate y'all. It's always a pleasure to see familiar faces. Mine too, we got to get together. Because I just, I just dropped out of thin air because I went to, I don't know, I went comps land i went to comps land um, but i'm out of comps land um i appreciate y'all um i look forward to continuing to be in community with y'all i'll be in athens for probably a year and a half is what my advisor is telling me so i'm looking i'm looking forward to to really doing some work with y'all in the near future so peace thank you all right Thanks, everybody. Nice to see you. Thank you all ya. for coming Bye. on behalf of Athens Anti Discrimination Movement. Thank you, Barb. Thank you, Montu. Thank you, Alejandra. Um, we thank you, Dad, Charles Napper. Appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, for the parents rolling through. Thank you to our amazing uh, AADM interns. Uh, we could not have done this without you. So thank you very, very much. Y'all tune in next week. Next week, we are going to have voting rights taught by the CEO, executive director, and founder, co-founder of Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement, our very own Mocha Jasmine Johnson. So it is sure to be an outstanding uh, class. And then the following week, we're going to have a class uh, called Town. Uh, so spread the word about that. And then our very last class is going to be taught by Montu Miller. And that class is going to be on code switching on May 19th. So every Thursday, stick with us. We appreciate you all being here. Thank you once again to Damaris Dunn for an amazing, outstanding class. Appreciate you. Oh, Have a good night, y'all. Thank good you. Night.